Happy 4th of July, everybody! Happy 4th of July, everybody! Happy 4th of July, everybody! I have been waiting an entire year, now two years, to do this video. You see, we tried to do something two years ago on Independence Day, and, well, it ended up being a total disaster. Then last year, well, this is what I filmed last year. This year, I wanted to talk to you a little bit about the signers of the Declaration of Independence. As you know, today we celebrate our country's birthday. It was this day in 1776 that the Continental Congress formally adopted the Declaration of Independence. And I think that a lot of Americans understand the significance of the Declaration of Independence, but I don't believe most of us have really taken time to think about the mindset of the men who signed it and the circumstances under which it was signed. I myself didn't give that much thought prior to the genesis of the Tea Party movement, but in the past few years it's occurred to me what these men were doing. They, they were committing high treason against what at that time was the richest, most powerful empire mankind had ever known. Yes, even greater than the Byzantine Empire. And I'm sure that they knew that this might not work out for them. I'm sure they appreciated the gravity of what they were doing, that if this revolution thing didn't work out, then they were going to meet with some pretty ugly consequences. But that was the risk they were willing to take. So important were these principles, these inalienable rights, as they put it, to them, that they were willing to sacrifice everything. And most, if not all of them, probably also knew that even if this revolution ended well for this fledgling republic, that they might not survive to see it. And in fact, a lot of them did not live to see victory. John Morton, a judge from Ridley, Pennsylvania, was the first of the signers to perish. Surprisingly, little is known about the circumstances surrounding his death, but according to the Reverend Charles A. Goodrich, Morton was seized with an inflammatory fever, which, after a few days, ended his mortal existence. He left a sizable estate to his wife and eight kids, but shortly after his demise, they had to flee from their home in the face of an imminent British attack. Button Gwinnett, an English-born merchant who became a respected statesman from Georgia, died as a result of injuries he sustained in a 1777 duel with his longtime nemesis, Brigadier General Lachlan McIntosh. Philip Livingston, a farmer from Albany, New York, continued to sit on the Continental Congress after signing the Declaration of Independence, and it was actually during the sixth session of the Congress where he died suddenly on June 12, 1778. He's buried in the Prospect Hills Cemetery in York, Pennsylvania. John Hart was a farmer from New Jersey who, after the Second Continental Congress, was elected Speaker of the newly formed New Jersey General Assembly, Treasurer of the Council of Safety, President of the Joint Meetings of the New Jersey Congress, and Commissioner of the State Loan Office. In the fall of 1776, British and Hessian troops raided his Hunterdon County farm. Hart was driven from the side of his desperately ill wife, Deborah, who later died. He returned to what he had left, and in June of 1778, he actually invited the American army to encamp on his property. 12,000 men camped on his fields during the growing season. They later won the Battle of Monmouth. John Hart died less than a year after that, on May 11, 1779. George Ross had served as a colonel in the Pennsylvania militia at the beginning of the revolution and vice president of the first constitutional convention for Pennsylvania. He resigned from the Continental Congress in 1777 because of poor health, 
was appointed to the Pennsylvania Court of Admiralty and died in office at age 49. Joseph Hughes was our first ever Secretary of the Navy. After signing the Declaration of Independence, his ailing health forced him to return to his home in New Jersey. He served out his last few months as a congressman, but died on November 10, 1779, shortly before his 50th birthday. All of the Congress came to his funeral the following day and mourned the great loss that the country had suffered. At 26, Thomas Lynch Jr. of South Carolina was the youngest delegate to sign the Declaration of Independence. He was taken ill towards the end of 1779 and set sail with his wife for St. Eustatius, an island in the West Indies. Why they did that is not exactly clear, and it may be unrelated to his illness, but anyway, their ship disappeared at sea during a storm and was never found. You can still visit Hopsui. Hopsui? I don't know how that's pronounced. Anyway, that's the uh, Lynch family plantation in South Carolina. George Taylor was one of the older delegates at the Continental Congress. He was a successful ironmaster in Pennsylvania, and after signing the Declaration, was elected to the new Supreme Executive Assembly of Pennsylvania, but retired from public life soon afterward and returned to his work on the Durham Furnace. But after the state dispossessed him of his lease, he moved back to Easton in April of 1780 and died there on February 23, 1781, at the age of 65. Five days later, a New Jersey lawyer named Richard Stockton died at his family's estate in Princeton. Stockton is an exceptional story. On November 30, 1776, he was captured along with a friend, John Covenhoven. According to this book I found at the library, Stockton and Covenhoven were dragged from their beds by loyalists, stripped of their property, and marched to Perth Amboy and turned over to the British. His estate in Princeton seen, was occupied by John Cornwallis during his imprisonment. Stockton's furniture, as well as all his household belongings, crops, and livestock were either taken or destroyed by the British. His library, one of the finest in the colonies, was burned to smithereens. According to his son-in-law, Dr. Benjamin Rush, himself a signer of the Declaration of Independence, Stockton was permitted to return to his family upon parole, but as I said, he later died at his family's home in Princeton. Less than eight months later, Cornwallis surrendered to George Washington at Yorktown. Other signers of the Declaration of Independence survived the Revolution only to die broke. A handful of others enjoyed considerably more success. You're probably familiar with John Hancock, Benjamin Franklin, John Adams, and his cousin Samuel, Thomas Jefferson, uh, this guy, the gerrymandering guy, the Brothers Lee, one of whom I believe was Robert E. Lee's grandfather, and Samuel Chase. But for a lot of them, it was not a happy ending. And yet, their courage has been immortalized in this document, of which an as yet undetermined number of copies were made that could be just about anywhere. Understand when they signed this, and of course most of them did not sign it on July 4th, that was the day it was adopted, but that's a story for another time. They knew, I mean, these were, a lot of, most of them were very successful men of considerable import in society. They could have lived out their lives in relative comfort, the oppressive tyranny of the crown notwithstanding, but they were willing to give all that up. That's how important this cause was to them. We know that. We know that they were aware of the consequences of their actions, potentially, because of how they concluded. Look at how they concluded the Declaration of Independence. 
For the support of this declaration, with a firm reliance on the protection of divine providence, we mutually pledge to each other our lives, our fortunes, and our sacred honor. That's what they were risking. Well, their lives and their fortunes, anyway. They were giving that up to preserve their honor. It's really something worth thinking about. So, enjoy your Independence Day, however you choose to celebrate it. And I Oh, that's right, I have a blog. Sorry, it's really hot out here. And humid. It was probably also very hot and humid that day in July and August, that summer, when they met. We almost got through editing that video in time to upload it on July 4th, 2012. But we didn't. So, I hope you enjoyed that. I thought it was interesting. Finally, thank you very much to our brave soldiers, those who have served us in battle in the past and those who are currently serving our country. Thanks for putting your lives on the line to defend the liberties and values that our founding fathers enshrined in the Declaration of Independence 237 years ago.